Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, High Throughput Production of Autoantigens for Rapid Detection of Multiple Autoimmune Diseases, presented by Amin Shu, Professor in Medicine, Professor in Pharmacology and Pharmacy, and Director of State Key Laboratory of Pharmaceutical Biotechnology, University of Hong Kong. I'm Alexis Krauss of Labrits, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labrits and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information about our sponsor, please visit www.thermofisher.com. Before I begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Amin Zhu. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for joining my uh, presentation. So my laboratory at the uh, University of Hong Kong, so we focus on the biomarker discovery and also development of high throughput assays and also therapeutic and antibodies and proteins for chronic diseases such as diabetes, autoimmune disease, and cancer. So today, so I'm going to share with you uh, our experience on how to use bacular virus to produce um, high-quality uh, high autoantigens for diagnostic purpose. So what I'm going to do today, so I will firstly brief introduce you and then about the autoimmune disease, what is autoimmune disease. And then I will elaborate a little bit more of, on what is the current challenges for diagnosis of autoimmune disease and then the strategies we are adopted to, uh, 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 for these challenges. And also, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the last several minutes of my talk, and I will uh, give you some examples of our, uh, how to use the autoantigens we detect, uh, express for develop high throughput assays for simultaneous detection of multiple autoimmune disease. So autoimmune disease, as you know, is actually can occurs at anywhere in our body. So this actually is a, our own, uh, immune system actually mistakenly recognize our own proteins or our own tissues as uh, the invading pathogens and then initiate immune attack. So up to now, actually there are over 80 types of autoimmune disease in our body have been detected. Even, for example, in the United States, there are over 23 million of patients and with uh, this uh, autoimmune disease. Actually, the incidence is increasing rapidly in these days. So there, the autoimmune disease, one of the unique features, actually, unlike other chronic diseases, actually the female has much higher incidence of autoimmune disease than male. And if you look at all the, almost all the different uh, categories of autoimmune disease, and the female has significantly higher incidence than male. So there are 78% of incidence occurs in female, but the tw uh, only 22% uh, occurs in male. Though that, uh, the autoimmune disease are classified actually into two general categories. That is a systemic disorder. So we have autoantibodies that are against to, uh, that is not specific to autoantigens in any tissues found. So that is including these seven disorders and that will, I, I will mention later on. And there are also uh, the second category we call these localized disorders. So autoantibodies are specific to our uh, uh, organ or particular tissues such as type 2 diabetes and also um, uh, thyroiditis and also uh, autoimmune hepatitis. 
So they um, actually they uh, auto, the pathogenesis the cause of autoimmune disease, disease is quite complicated. Involve many components from genetic factors, epigenetic factors, gut microbiotas, and the environmental factors, and the only uh, many inflammatory factors. And then there are actually uh, these factors can synergize and then for the development of autoimmune disease. And there are many types of uh, immune cells are involved in pathogenesis of autoimmune disease, and then including uh, these inert, they are all these major cells involved in, in uh, inert immunity and the major type of cells involved in uh, adaptive immunity. Uh, so each of these autoimmune disease, they have its own uh, 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 unique pathogenesis, but generally all this um, inert immunity and, uh, and then adaptive immunity play a role. So at the early stage, the overactivation of inert immunity can cause the cell death in the certain tissues and then release the self antigen and then trigger the adaptive immunity and then causes the targeted cell death and also the tissue damage and then onset of autoimmune disease. Again, the, one of the uh, unique features for this autoimmune disease, again, they have the family aggravation or family cluster. And there are two types of clusters in the uh, 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 acne happens uh, in that. One is called, we call the familial autoimmunity. So in this case, for example, in the left this, uh, side is panel, uh, this mother, she has four and then subcapunity no side and then risk genes. And then he, her, uh, she has uh, the uh, autoimmune disease and the autoimmune uh, uh, disease, but her three kids actually have a different autoimmune disease. In the second case, in the, we call this polyautoimmunity. So in that case, the mother herself is actually uh, healthy, but she has risk gene. And then her uh, four kids, for example, one kid is healthy and the other, other three kids, they have different autoimmune disease. As you can see from this case, from familial autoimmunity and the poly autoimmunity. So this suggests the autoimmunity, the pathogenesis is quite complicated. So the highlight, the complexity of this autoimmunity, and then you need a high throughput screening methods to detect a wide spectrum of autoimmune disease uh, in the general population. So the uh, diagnosis of the autoimmune disease actually is rather complicated. So according to American Autoimmune Disease, Diet, uh, Disease Association, the latest statistic shows the autoimmune disease patients urinary, it takes almost five years and to see at least five doctors before a proper diagnosis can, can be made. As you know, the for uh, most of the disease and then the initial diagnosis start with the symptoms. If the patients and with, with uh, any uh, symptoms, they will go to see a doctor and then start with the medical examination. But in, for the majority of the autoimmune disease, actually the symptoms are not very typical. And then they either like fatigue or other symptoms, and then doctors or patients often ignore. They often uh, develop, until they develop a very se severe complications, and then the diagnosis can be made. So in that case, so they so they, but now you know, there's a common technology or a diagnostic methods for uh, autoimmune disease, as you know, is the, uh, uh, so you, we use auto, the uh, immunodetection to detect the autoimmune antibodies in the circulation. So however, so we have faced uh, many challenges in using this autoimmune, uh, this uh, 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 technology. So, Major challenge is the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. 
So although we have a lot of these diagnostic products in the market, however, so what the auto antigens used in the market mainly are produced from bacteria. So this bacterially expressed protein often makes the proper epitopes that resembles the endogenous proteins in our body. Therefore, so this cannot be recognized properly by the autoantibodies in our body. So this causes decreased sensitivity and also the, uh, the compromise accuracy. So the second challenge for the uh, diagnosis of this autoimmune diabetes, autoimmune disease, is the lack actually of the pathogenic biomarker. So most of these uh, the autoantibodies or autoantigens we are uh, detecting actually is only the consequence of the disease. So do not provide any pathogenic uh, insight. And, uh, and another challenge is actually the low uh, throughput screening, and this I will elaborate a little bit uh, later on. So in my lab laboratory, the first thing we want to do and we want to try to find the new biomarkers and which has the higher sensitivity and the high specificity for this autoimmune diseases. And uh, I just, uh, in this case, I will t uh, give this, uh, the autoimmune diabetes as an example, how can we use our platform to discover the novel uh, the, uh, biomarkers for better diagnosis. So as you know, the autoimmune diabetes is caused by the, um, so the pancreas, the complete disruption of our pancreatic beta cells due to the autoimmunity. At this stage, the diagnosis of autoimmune diabetes relies on several autoantibodies in our circulation and that is specific to our pancreatic beta uh, islet such as these autoantibodies against the GAT and uh, IA2, IAA, and also zinc BAB, uh, uh, TBA. So because they, uh, this diagnosis requires a very high sensitivity, the majority of laboratory uh, in the uh, world right now, they're using the radio immuno uh, diagnostic measures. And then in that case, we need the uh, radio iodine so for the detection. As you know, in this causes a lot of the inconvenience because of the short half-life and also the uh, radioactivity hazard. And there are only a few lab, uh, the, a small portion of the clinical diagnostic laboratory can do that. And even that, and then the detection rate is only about the uh, 50 to 70 to 80 percent. And also, you can only detect this at the very late stage. So because uh, there is a, uh, a couple of years ago, there is a paper published in Nature Medicine shows this neutrophil actually play a very important role in the initiation of the autoimmune diabetes. And then, the, as you know, this neutrophil is the first line of inner immune uh, cells, and these Neutrophils actually can cause and attack the, uh, the, uh, the, the attack of pathogens and then by net formation, by releasing the two the major proteases, and that including this neutrophil elastase and also the protein S3. And these two uh, proteases and then play an important role in the inflammation and during the neutrophil function. Therefore, and then to see whether a lot of these two uh, serum proteases has any diagnostic uh, value for autoimmune disease, and then we use the pipeline and that as were established in our laboratory for generation of assays. So in my laboratory, so we have established a comprehensive platform ranging from omicus-based biomarker discovery using uh, uh, metabolomicus, proteomicus, and that, uh, in our uh, several of our well-established uh, clinical study cohort. And then 
followed by the expression of proteins using different systems, uh, such as E. coli, mammalia system, and the yeast, and also insect cells. And now we can generate the antibodies either from the polycon antibody uh, sources or molecular antibodies, and then we develop a different assay format starting from traditional ELISA and then to uh, the chemiluminescence based high sensitive assay and the high throughput and the immunoturbulence based assay and also strip based assay uh, um, as I will elaborate later on. And then we validate our assays in our clinical study cohort. And in this case, and then we use the memorial expression system for uh, this expression of NE and the PR3 because these two proteins, they actually, they are post-translationally modified. So we successfully express the protein using the memorial expression system and they generated uh, the high specific assay. So afterwards, we uh, validated our assays in uh, patients with type uh, autoimmune disease uh, with different durations. And that, as you can see from here, compare with healthy individual and those patients with newly onset diabetes, as you can see the first uh, panel of the figure, they have much higher concentration of NE, and that is neutrophil electase, and also much higher concentration of PR3. And then this concentration actually gradually declined after the, uh, uh, the three and the five years. So that's suggesting, so these two biomarkers are involved in the onset of the, during the early stage of the disease, and that you can use that for early diagnosis. And then we also developed this, uh, the biochemical assay, for the enzymatic assay for these two, uh, the, um, uh, for these two uh, markers and find a similar pattern. And uh, most importantly, we found that these two biomarkers the concentration closely associated with the positivity of those classical autoantibodies detected in autoimmune uh, diabetic patients. And this clearly suggesting to these patients, uh, these two biomarkers can be used for acne risk prediction and also early detection of autoimmune disease. And then we actually are now collaborating with many uh, clinical centers to do the further validation and the promote its clinical application. And because these two biomarkers and we find this is closely associated with uh, the bad cell autoimmunity and the compare with the classical biomarkers. And this biomarker actually can provide the pathogenic inside and is more sensitive and also accurate and also more effective for diagnosis of autoimmune disease. So that is actually the, our effort how to uh, develop the uh, new biomarkers for autoimmune disease. And in the second part, so I'm uh, going to discuss how to use the uh, bacula virus system for high throughput expression of recombinant autoantigens that can closely resemble the natural antigens in our body um, for diagnostic purpose. So this, uh, the uh, autoimmune diseases are class can be generally classified into two classes. So one is systemic autoimmune disease or systemic disorders. So in this case, the autoantibodies are not specific to any autoantigens found in certain tissues. So these can include seven major classes, including this SLE, finger syndrome, mixed collective tissue uh, diseases, and then syst systemic sclerosis, and then also PM and DM. So the diagnosis of this systemic autoimmune disease re actually relies on those autoantibodies 
belongs to a specific unique category we call these anti-nuclear antibodies. To the second class of autoimmune disease, we call this localized autoimmune disease. So in this case, the autoantibodies are specific to an organ or a particular tissue, such as this autoimmune diabetes, and then autoimmune hepatitis, and then uh, uh, there are a lot, the over acne, 80 localized autoimmune disease. And then for this, so each of these systemic autoimmune diseases, such as SLE and then SS and the mixed collective tissue uh, diseases, each of that, actually there are many of these autoantibodies against specific antigens has already been discovered. Uh, so uh, this is actually well established. For example, for this SLE, and we have there are uh, over around 40 to 90 percent of the detection rate or prevalence rates, and then for this, uh, so different autoantibodies against different autoantigens, they have different detection rate, but each patient they are different. So therefore, it's important to have a full spectrum of these autoantibodies are um, detected in these patients because these systemic autoimmune disease, they are often interrelated. And the patients with all one autoimmune disease often has the other. And then they also have the family clusters. For example, these patients have SLE and then maybe the family members, the other family members they have other systemic autoimmune disease. So therefore, uh, one of the purpose of our study, so we want to try to express the autoantigens that can uh, be used for detection of all these autoimmune antibodies simultaneously. And then, so we choose the uh, bacterial virus for this purpose. And then why the bacterial virus? Uh, simply because uh, a lot of these autoantigens I mentioned uh, in the previous slides, actually they are post-translational modified. They are, uh, the molecular size actually is quite big. They are often insoluble. It's not soluble if you use a bacterial expression system. And But if you use the mammalian expression system, and then the yield is often uh, high, and then the cost is, is not the cost effective, and then it's not uh, so easy to promote the, uh, the clinical application. Therefore, so we choose a peculiar viral system to express in the insect cells because the peculiar virus also, can, they, these insect cells can also have proper post translational modifications, and then Furthermore, compare with this uh, mammalian expression system, and then these have additional several advantages. It's much more efficient, and also have very high yield and lower cost compared to mammalian expression system. And before that, and then we introduce, uh, I want to give you a very brief background about this bacterial virus infection and the insect cell expression system. So the bacterial virus, and once they start infecting the insect cells, and then it's uh, mainly composed of the three stages. And then early stage, so the virus will get into the cells, and then in the first six hours, and then this will get the insect cells prepared for virus replication. And then at the later stage, and this virus Actually, this will produce the body of the virus, this BV. So the body of the virus actually is responsible for infections or communications between tissues and the cells. And at the, every net stage, and that two major proteins, polyhedron proteins and also piton proteins are produced. And these will produce 
the big virus particle we call occlusion body virus, and that is ODV. This occlusion body virus actually is responsible for infections between individuals. And then this actually the bacterial virus insect cells expression system and take advantage actually the strong expression of the two uh, major proteins that is polyhedral proteins and also p proteins. And these two proteins actually are expressed at the late, very late stage of infection but are not required by, uh, for the uh, infectious cycle of the virus. So in early days, so we use a bacterial virus system actually, and then we need uh, to use a, uh, to generate a transfer plasmid, and this transfer plasmid was flanked by two regions that have two flanking sequences, and that is similar or the same with bacterial virus. And then they, uh, this, they, uh, uh, plasmid, recombinant plasmids are made actually by classical recombination. And then so this uh, actually is often a very, a very low efficiency. And also in this case, there's no selection marker. So we need to rely on the experienced researchers to use their bare eyes and to see they are to find the positive clones, and then because after the polyhedron, uh, this uh, proteins is replaced, and we cannot see uh, these uh, big uh, particles anymore. So in nowadays, I think due to the invention of this uh, called back-to-back bacterial virus insect expression system, and that makes our work uh, much easier. And this back-to-back bacterial virus insect expression system mainly composed of the three uh, plasmids. So one is the backmid. So this backmid, the backbone is still the bacterial virus, but that is the, uh, uh, so it's modified so that this polyhedron, uh, this region is replaced, is depleted, uh, denuded, and replaced by this lexi gene. And this also with a small in, insertion of this small, uh, the, uh, the se- a short sequence uh, from transportation. And also we added a, a select genes. And then the second one is actually the dollar plasmid. So that includes also two similar transposing sequence together with the target genes and uh, also the genetomycin selection genes. And then we need a third plasmid that is a helper, uh, a helper plasmid that encode actually the transportase and that is facilitate the transposition. And then therefore, so after we transform all these plasmid into the bacteria, this system, and the recombination can occur at a very high efficiency because this uh, uh, facilitated uh, transposition system. And then furthermore, and then the selection is much easier. So we can use the, uh, the system, uh, this selection system, firstly, so we can use a color selection because this next gene will be inactivated by insertion of this plasmid, the target gene, and then we can use blue and white color for selection. And additionally, uh, this uh, gelatinizing resistance will also allow us to use the antibiotics for selection. So therefore, and this uh, expression system just have three uh, very uh, relatively simple uh, steps. The first step is to generate a recombinant at uh, the back meat. So you can synthesize your dollar plus meat and then um, by any uh, uh, so service providers and and then you can transform uh, this dollar plus meat directly into this DH term 
back cells. So these cells already host the other two plasmids, including uh, this um, uh, helper plasmid and also the, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, back meat. And then you isolate uh, this uh, recombinant back meat uh, by the simple color selection, antibiotic uh, resistance. And then once you've got the purification and the, uh, this back meat, and you can transfect this uh, to your insect cells and then in adherent uh, SF line cells. And then after the transfection, you can start to test whether or not your protein is expressed and then by uh, Western blood and all other activity tests. And then you can harvest the superlacent as the first generation of your virus, and then you can amplify your virus, and this often takes two to three weeks, and the most tenuous step. And then you can uh, do, uh, test the titration of your virus, and then and you get your virus stopped. So the first phase is the optimization and the expression uh, and purification of your target proteins. And then for each of the proteins, there is no, acting, I should say, and there is no standard solution for the titers of the, uh, uh, the virus you, needed for, you need for expression of higher, for higher expression of your protein. So in that case, and we need to optimize what is the base concentration and that required to achieve, to achieve higher expression of the protein case by case. And then you can scale up your uh, expression system. For example, you can, in our case, you, we use a fermentation system. And when you use a fermentation system, and then uh, if you, you can, the achieve the cell density up to uh, uh, 10 to the power of the 7. And if you use the con uh, serum-free conditioned medium. And then after several days, and you can just collect the cells, collect the medium, and then you can do the purification for that. So by using uh, this system, and then within several months, so we are able to express 22 autoantigens I mentioned earlier, and with a very high uh, purity and a very high yield uh, via this uh, insect expression system, as you can see from here. And then this is uh, uh, the uh, so we can we are able to get the single bands for most of these proteins, and then actually they are very hard to express, very hard to purify if you use bacteria expression system, and then. So by using, and then after we got all these recombinant uh, autoantigens from the insect cells, and we also tested their reactivity and then using the uh, immunoreaction to see whether or not the epitope of these autoantigens can be recognized properly by the autoantibodies in those patients with autoimmune diseases. And this is just give you some examples. How do we um, do the validation process? For example, so we can, um, so, uh, so probe all that we can feed all these auto, -anti uh, auto, uh, auto antibodies, our auto antigens or recombinant auto antigens we produce either fix that in a membrane, like Western blood type of membrane, or you just spot that into a membrane. And then we do the Western blood type of reactions and using either the human, uh, uh, the healthy subject, which does not contain any autoantibodies, or we use uh, the uh, serum from the autoimmune disease, and this has the autoantibodies. As you can see from here, so these patients, they have these uh, finger syndromes, and then this can clearly identify the autoantigens we produce using the insect cells, but a healthy individual does not have that. And this actually is a patient with a mixed uh, collective tissue disease that can produce this recombinant 
antigen, this auto recombinant uh, antigens will produce, and then they uh, show a very strong positivity, but it's highly specific. But in healthy subjects, we cannot find any positive signal at all. So this actually shows, and this bacterial viral system, expression system, is very powerful in expressing the high quality autoantigens that can be recognized properly by the uh, uh, auto and endogenous autoantibodies in the patients. And then afterwards, and then we start to use this uh, 22 auto high quality autoantigens we produce to detect a single membrane based assay for simultaneous detection of this uh, multiple autoimmune disease. And as I said early on, because this systemic autoimmune disease, seven major autoimmune disease, they are often interrelated. You rely on many autoantibodies for uh, diagnosis. So they, uh, so they, uh, so we uh, can either because for these clinical applications, for some of the hospitals, they only need. Uh, the single uh, marker detection we have also produced is uh, uh, traditional ELISA-based detection measures. And then for this single membrane-based uh, detection measures, it works like that. So, for, so, uh, so we target in our case, for example, for uh, these seven major systemic autoimmune disease. And for each of these autoimmune disease, and that is each color, so we select several autoantigens that is, uh, show high uh, prevalency in the patients based on the literature. And then, so, and uh, after that, so this is the, uh, the, our uh, overall protocols we use uh, for production this uh, membrane-based chip. And then you can simply uh, stick the uh, natural cellular membrane so onto a PVC uh, support, and then we can dispense and these different type of these auto antigens we produce into this membrane. And then we cut this auto uh, uh, antigen uh, embedded uh, nitrocellular membrane node into uh, strips, and then we generate uh, this kind of strip for that. And then you can see from here, and then so we uh, we also uh, use the, uh, the um, uh, microfluidics based uh, the detection measures and then for to facilitate the detection. In this case, so we can complete the assays within 30 minutes. So, for example, this is just uh, several clinical validation cases. We have validated our assays in over two pa uh, 200 patients and with clinical Early diagnosed autoimmune disease, and then as you can see from here, and then for each type of autoimmune uh, disease, and then we can show uh, very um, uh, the diagnosis with very high uh, efficacy, and then uh, this SOE you can show the regions, the several bands, and then in the uh, with the uh, uh, the uh, uh, expected autoimmune antigen, uh, autoantigen, they are uh, very positive. And then in the right panel, uh, you can see these finger syndromes, and there's one very prominent, uh, the autoantibodies that can be detected. And then in the second panel, as you can see, these patients and with mixed collective uh, tissue uh, diseases, and then you can see this Two patients, they have two different autoantibodies against two different autoantigens. So that highlight is important to have this simultaneous screening of multiple autoantigens in order to increase the accuracy and also sensitivity for diagnosis. So they uh, actually were also compared to this uh, the autoantigens we produced from these um, uh, insect cells 
So we find that there has much higher sensitivity and also much higher specificity than those proteins generated from the uh, bacterial system. So in our case, so our system can detect seven um, autoimmune diseases and simultaneously with a single membrane based assay and with sensitivity of over 95% uh, from the 200 of clinical uh, diagnostic cases we have validated so far. And then because the anti the epitope can be recognized easily by those um, autoantibody, endogenous autoantibodies, we are able to detect all these autoantigens and then uh, within 30 minutes compared to a lot of these traditional assays which will take at least 90 minutes to complete the entire assay with still a very lower sensitivity. Therefore, I, uh, a very short summary from my talk, so we can show, uh, show you uh, from our uh, experience, and we are able to use the uh, system, uh, uh, mammalian expression system, to generate the high quality of biomarkers and for their assays, and which can detect the autoimmune diabetes with much higher sensitivity and also provide the pathological insight. And then we have shown and that we use this back-to-back bacterial virus and the insect cell expression system can reliably express autoantigens that can be recognized by endogenous autoantibodies of different autoimmune diseases and uh, with very high efficiency. And then by using these autoantigens produced from this bacterial virus, we are able to produce a high throughput assays that can simultaneously screen in and also detect seven major interrelated autoimmune disease and with significantly improved sensitivity and also reduced detection time. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Xu, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on the screen, and click the Send button. Dr. Xu and Dr. Zhang will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, is there any other advantages of back-to-back -back systems, especially regarding the high-throughput expression? Uh, uh, thank you. I think uh, in addition to get the uh, high yield expression of uh, um, uh, proteins, so this back-to-back uh, -back system can also allow you to uh, express two proteins simultaneously. So if you use the P, uh, PFAS pack dual system, so this actually take advantage of the two strong promoters of bacterial viral system. So including this uh, uh, polyhedron promoter and also a uh, PTEM promoter. So if you use that, so you can clone two genes and then into the one uh, single vector to express the two proteins and then maybe they are functionally uh, relevant. Thank you. Now our next question is, have you compared the performance of insect cell-derived and bacteria cell-derived autoantigens? in terms of the sensitivity and specificity in detecting circulate, excuse me, detecting circulating autoantibodies? Uh, maybe this I will uh, ask my co-worker, uh, Dr. Kelsey Dong, to answer the question. Uh, thank you. So um, we basically, com uh, after the generation of the insect cell-derived autoantigens, we also purchased some very uh, well-characterized bacterial, bacterial detectable 
bacterial cell derived autoantigens and perform their uh, performance in validating the clinical samples in terms of the health serum or the serum from the autoimmune disease patient. And we found that the sensitivity as well as the specificity of house generated uh, autoantigens are much more better than the in market bacterial cell derived autoantigens. So we are very uh, confident about uh, these high quality autoantigens we performed. Thanks. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Now this is a two part question. Is there, excuse me, is there any mechanistic and or technical differences in the diagnosis of localized and systematic autoimmune diseases? And do you have any R&D plan for diagnosis of localized autoimmune diseases? Um, thank you. So for the first question, so although the autoimmune diseases are classified as systemic or localized diseases, but the uh, detection method, or we know the mechanistic diagnostic solution, is also based on the circulation of the autoantibodies. So for example, the autoimmune diabetes, although it's the destruction of the pancreatic beta cells, the release is also, they also can release the autoantibodies like GADA and the IA2A into the circulation. So it is the same to use the recombinant autoantigens to detect the circulating autoantibodies. And uh, uh, in the future, we are, as we uh, discussed before, there are over 80 different types of autoimmune diseases identified in human beings, and majority of them are localized diseases. So we are actually actively preparing and uh, developing, uh, all, we want to develop all the, um, the immunoassays for the diagnosis of all the autoimmune diseases, including the localized autoimmune diseases. So our next product uh, is about to, uh, using the uh, new biomarkers from the autoimmune diabetes to generate a panel, a series of the diagnostic products for the autoimmune diabetes. And later on, such as autoimmune hepatitis, uh, autoimmune inflammatory bowel diseases, and so on. So that is our future plan. Thank you. I would like to once again thank Dr. Xu for his informative presentation. I would also like to thank Thermo Fisher Scientific for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through September of 2019. Please share that with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.